a friend of mine uh, who was who was from New York, and he said, "Oh, you know the Jews run New York," and it's little things like that. When he has no idea, it's it's just it's it's sort of it's misconception and it's creeping in. My guests today are Dan Wolf and Sam Thorpe Spinks, two actor producers whose newest production, titled Eminent Presents A Night of New Jewish Writing, features six standalone short plays, which was created as a response to their experiences of anti Semitism. The production will be playing at the Kiln Theatre on August 8th and 9th. Dan and Sam, thanks so much for joining us. How are you? Good, thank you. Thanks so much for having us on. Yeah, thank you very much. Look forward to talking to you. Good, good. Me too. Um, so look, right off the bat, um, I, I want to point out that I think it's notable that your play is at the Kiln Theatre, because I would be remiss if I didn't point out that in 2014, which at that the Kiln, which at that point was known as the Tricycle Theatre, it boycotted the UK Jewish Film Festival due to the conflict in Gaza at the time. And the theatre demanded that the film festival drop funding it received from the Israeli embassy. Uh, now, this caused so much upset within the Jewish community, with many even alleging anti-Semitism, that a protest was organized outside of the theater in response. And that protest was essentially the birth of campaign against anti-Semitism. Around a year later, the theater's chairman apologized. And now, eight years later, they're putting on a production uh, by Jewish artists highlighting anti-Semitism. And it now seems to be making an effort to engage with the feelings of Jewish creators, which arguably was a far cry from where it was eight years ago. From my perspective, it's a good thing to see how far it's come. And now we have your play, Eminent Presents, A Night of New Jewish Writing. Without giving too much away, can you tell us a bit more about the play, Dan? Yeah, so we've, um, we've commissioned six um, Jewish writers um, with a simple brief um, we sort of wanted to, we wanted to ask them to write something about what it means to them to be Jewish, um, specifically how might we define being Jewish and how is that changing. We've given them six, uh, so we've, we've, we've commissioned six writers to write about 15 minutes worth of scene. Um, we're going to, we've employed six Jewish directors and we've got Jewish actors involved. Um, and it was very much a chance for these writers to sort of explore their Jewishness. It was a chance to kind of be unapologetically Jewish um, on a blank canvas um, in a sort of a main stage London theatre. I mean, Sam, how, how did you sort of um, first, well, how, how did you both sort of come up with the, this, this, <laughs> the idea of the play? So, so it's been an incredibly collaborative uh, journey. Um, we started talking to people at the end of last year, nine months ago. <laughs> it's taken a, a long time to get it to this point. Um, but the, the real kind of genesis of the idea came from Dan and I finishing drama school. And uh, at the time, and I'm sure we'll touch on it, there was a thing at the Royal Court. And we spoke kind of openly maybe for the first time about our experiences and just going, oh, this happened whilst we were at Guildhall. We never really talked about it. You know, Dan and I, we always, you know, we knew we were very aware we were the only two Jewish people in the year. Um, and, and yeah, we just spoke openly for the first time. And, and it, we wanted to create something that was, <laughs> we wanted something avoid of politics, avoid of anything about social media, something that offered this, a space for Jewish creatives to connect in a really um, positive and uh, constructive way. And, and when we first thought of the idea, we didn't actually know what it was we were going to do, but we, we knew there was something about having established writers and kind of emerging actors. Um, and our thing was maybe about bridging that connection. And the moment we started reaching out to um, writers and creatives, I, I think we were slightly... Uh, 
shocked about how how generous people were with their time. Um, we met with all the writers. They were they gave us loads of their time, and now they're writing. Um, and it was it was a really the whole process has been so uh, important and really special. I feel, and you know, even our relationship with the the kiln and you know everything's been about having a conversation and, and trying to create something that is uh, important and pertinent. Mm. When, when you went into this thing, uh, why did you decide to make it six unconnected scenes? And does each scene have its own distinct theme? There, we've, we sort of wanted a thread throughout. I mean, we wanted to be as loose as possible in order to give the writers as much free reign. Um, I think that was something we were quite keen on. And it was about little tasters, little, little bits of ideas being formed. Um, we're, we're quite keen on it being a sort of work in progress thing. We don't, we're not interested in creating a polished event or polished outcome. Um, it's very much about working through, and it's sort of a reflection of, in a way, it's a reflection of conversations that we can have and discussions that we have where, where ideas are explored and we can touch on lots of little things. Um, some of the pieces are sort of spookily quite linked, even though the writers didn't do it together. Um, themes about, you know, um, ancestry tests or about sort of how do we tick a box on a form? Where do we fall in the diversity list? You know, all these things. Um, but we wanted to try and allow these writers, many of whom have been writing for decades, um, sometimes about being Jewish, sometimes not about being Jewish, but we wanted to give these writers just a chance to try something, to say, here's 15 minutes at Kiln Theatre, um, we'll give you a load of Jewish actors, we'll get a Jewish director, and here's a chance to, to be unapologetic and to say something that maybe you wouldn't feel comfortable saying somewhere else, or you'd be worried about a commission or worried about ticket sales or yeah. blah, blah, blah. It's about saying, here's a chance to um, explore something, you know, um, and we wanted to try and do that. We wanted to cover f as, as many bases as possible and sort of keep yeah. the evening as, as, as uh, holistic as possible. It, you know, every time we had a conversation, we, we talk about their relationship with their Jewishness from when they were younger to now to being a creative in the industry. And I, and every time anti-Semitism imbued their, the, the context of their work, or at some point they'd faced a programming thing in the 90s, or, you know, th th there was always an element of anti-Semitism. And I think these plays, whilst, I mean, for us, it came from the anti-Semitism we faced, uh, well, not just when we were at drama school, but growing up. And I know Dan had a very different experience to me. Um, and I think that's what's great about having six short plays, is they are all snapshots of, in some way or another, someone's, journey as a as a jewish creative expressed through you know a, a kind of a myriad of stories some of them are about uh, 18th century jewish boxer and you know it, it, it touches on everything it, it's they're brilliant and we and we're so lucky to have worked with yeah some of the most uh, successful jewish writers in in the country that's fantastic. And it strikes me how um, the the process of, of this creation was that these actors, these writers, they wrote these scenes independently of each other. I assume they were kind of put into little groups and they went off and they did their own thing, 15 minutes each. And yet the, the through line is anti-Semitism or one of the through lines is anti-Semitism. And Am I right in thinking that the prompt that you gave them was not to do with anti-Semitism? Even it was how do we how do you define your Jewishness? Is that right? Yeah. Well, we sort of said, um, you know, how how do we define ourselves as Jewish, and how might that be changing through time? And what what I found uh, was that that question sort of prompt. It's you end up going well. How, yes. How do we define ourselves as being Jewish? But then, how does the rest of the world? also define us as being Jewish. Um, and that's such an important question. That's something that's kind of followed me around through my youth and to today is the idea of how the world sees us and what the parameters of our Jewishness is. 
and where the lines are and what, you know, and that obviously then creeps into anti-Semitism. It creeps into discrimination and prejudice because it's all about, well, what can I say about you? What decisions can I make about your Jewishness? So in asking a, a Jewish person to say, how do you define yourself as a Jew? We go, well, we're sort of conditioned partly, in my opinion, to think, well, how do, how do the non-Jews define us as Jews? Because that's what we're used to. I, I wouldn't want to put words into the mouths of any of the writers and say any of them are specifically about, you know, addressing anti-Semitism. But it is, you know, as Dan really um, interestingly said, like there, it's an unescapable, inescapable, sorry, um, permeation of, of your of of your identity, um, and you are you are a Jewish writer or a Jewish actor or Jewish director, and and that comes with. Uh, history. You you both uh, had had different upbringings, but you met at Guildhall Drama School, right? Yes. Yeah. Correct, and yeah. so at this school, um, you you both had experiences of anti-Semitism, which which you know partly inspired this play, and the Guildhall School of of Music and Drama has since reached out to you. Um, since this play has been announced. Um, what sort of things happened to you both whilst you were there? And do you feel that it's the fault of the school specifically or more that it's a wider cultural problem in higher education? Well, I think firstly, it's worth saying, and this will be different for Sam, um, but nothing changed when I went to Guildhall. I didn't suddenly start facing anti-Semitism. I faced anti-Semitism from a very young age. I grew up in, in Nottingham, where um, there are, the Jewish community is very small and very insular and very sort of hidden. Um, so I grew up in an area and I faced anti-Semitism from a very young age up, you know. Um, so I went to Guildhall and it wasn't anything new. Um, what did change was that suddenly... I started to get a sense of who I was and I started to get a sense of that I didn't have to necessarily apologize or hide about being Jewish. Um, and I obviously met Sam, who was sort of my first Jewish friend <laughs> in a way. <laughs> and we kind of we kind of we kind of got together and we sort of um, we spoke more and a dialogue was opened. I don't and I think Sam would agree. I don't blame Guildhall for the things we faced. I don't think Guildhall is an anti-Semitic institution. I don't think necessarily the staff that work there are anti-Semitic. A lot of the anti-Semitism we faced was peer on peer. Um, and most of it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a societal thing. It's, it's a, possibly it's a higher educational issue. It's about what people think they can say about what, what they should or shouldn't. Well, well, it sounds like it's almost um, quite sad and, and difficult in a different way. Because rather than facing anti-Semitism uh, and, and not knowing how to deal with it, it's more like, oh, more of this. Yeah, and, and it comes in the form of jokes and it comes in the form of little remarks and things that people think, well, it doesn't matter. I can say this because, well, in a way, Jews don't count. To, to quote a famous phrase, there's that. And it's also sort of, well, it's also conspiracy and it's bias. And it's if somebody says, uh, you know, a friend of mine uh, who was who was from New York and he said, oh, you know, the Jews run New York. And it's little things like that when he has no idea. It's, it's just it's it's sort of it's misconception and it's creeping in and it's in the fabric of our relationships and it's in the fabric of the way you know, I think that our, 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 you know, our society is formed. I, th I think with many institutions um, over the last few years, especially with, with BLM, but Guildhall specifically were going through a big change in, in, in personnel, but also in the curriculum and addressing kind of um, antiquated uh, texts that we are working on along with practices. Um, so there was there was a real movement within the school to to address a lot of kind of historical problems, and, and especially in, in in during the time of BLM, um, the school addressed it and, and created a platform and opened up the conversation for past and present students to talk about everything they've faced. And it was a painful but 
you know, I, I'm speaking on their behalf, but a very important discussion, I think. Um, you know, but saying that, there were things that, in terms of the Jewish um, texts and things that we studied, there, there was a, a hole in, 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 our, in our learning. And I think a lot of the anti-Semitism we faced, or anyone faces, is, is ignorance a lot of the time. I don't think it comes from malice. But unfortunately, with all you know, those sort of subconscious tropes that people have, there, there is there is a deep-seated uh, history and a, and, a, and a hatred that comes from that. But for us, it, it felt like people were just ignorant. And, and most of the time when we, on a few occasions when we addressed it, because I, I think I speak for us both here, we didn't call it out as much as we should have on a, on a peer-to-peer level. But when we did, people were willing to learn, you know, that there was always a, a welcomeness of of, of, ed, of education or, you know, people were on the whole happy to listen. But we didn't talk about it much. And I don't know why it is. And recently, I, you know, having this chance to talk to you and, and talk to the school, we suddenly start saying things and we go, oh, actually, that wasn't okay for some reason i thought oh you get little jokes and then you go oh it's just part of it you know that but actually when you start saying it, it's like no why should we have had to put up with that why why didn't we speak out or make a formal complaint you know not at just at drama school but in in rehearsal rooms professional rooms you know or even at school and yeah it, the moment you do start talking about it sometimes for the first time you you hear yourself and you go wow i, I was going to be okay with that just because you know, no one cares as much about the anti-Semitism as other things. And, and what happens is with each little thing, with each little remark, it chips away at something inside of you. It chips away, essentially, I think, at your sense of pride of being Jewish, right? There's like a your Jewish true inner self. And with each little thing, it gets stripped away and it gets poked at and it gets kind of um, damaged a little bit. So then you start to internalize it and you start to go, well, the jokes are sort of true or, well, it's sort of, it's, we're the butt of the joke and it's sort of okay because we have to be or someone has to be or it's okay. Um, every, it's an accumulative process that happens over years and years and years where you internalize it, internalize it, internalize it until you get to a point where you, you start to not hear it. I mean, it's terrifying, the idea that you become numb to the sense of discrimination. So I suppose we're trying to thaw out the numbness <laughs> in a way in, with this project. It's about a defrosting, you know, it's about a defrosting of this internalized anti-Semitism and saying actually laying bare the facts a little bit. And that, and Sam's right, it's not pretty and it's not nice. It's a little bit traumatic, but it's it's really important because we don't want future students to be going to Guildhall, to other drama schools, to other universities. And we know what the problems are in universities. It's it's so obvious that there are huge issues with anti-Semitism in universities in this country, like scaringly bad. Well, it, you know, and, it, and Guildhall felt like they were trying more than any other institution to address these problems. Um, but like Dan says, it's, it's an endemic to, to higher education. Um, my, my brother was at a, another university and, and, you know, there were strikes and protests throughout his entire time there. I, I mean, I, I, first of all, I think it's great that you guys are channeling your experiences into something creative and educational like this production. Um, not that you should or anyone should have ever had to gone through what you've gone through. I also think in some ways it's harder to call it out when it's a joke. You know, if someone's saying to your face, oh, obviously I, I hate Jews and, and, and Hitler was not that bad, which I'm not exaggerating, you do see on Twitter. Um, in some ways that's easier to call out because you can say, what the hell are you talking about? But when it's a joke, you know, people can always have the defense of, whoa, just relax. You can't take a joke. And, mm. you know, I think, Dan, I think it was you who said that during one of your acting exercises, um, part of the exercise was that pennies were thrown on the floor. And after it was done, someone came up to you um, and, and said, I bet you're going to be picking all of these up after class. I mean, what do you even say in that situation? That's ridiculous. Mm. Exactly. And, and, and that's that's such like a that's such a typical typical example of the of anti-Semitism that I think uh, I, that I have faced, uh, and it's so like it it comes from people who you think are your friends, and who I, I would still say that guy, you know, is it's it's relationships you form, and then suddenly a comment like that is made, 
And I wonder, and this idea of a joke, you know, and obviously I wonder if part of our sort of coping mechanism is we go, well, in a joke is a joke. And throughout history, a lot of things worse than jokes have happened to us. So maybe we go, we cut our losses and we go, well, we'll take the jokes because, mm. you know, we never quite know what's around the corner. I think I wonder if there's a built in thing that we deal with is that we go, well, uh, you know, it could be worse. We'll laugh it off. And I and I said this earlier, but I, I, I really believe this in that there's only so much of it you can take before you start to agree with it. You know, there's, there's only so much you can take before you start to go, well, you've got a point. And that's obviously when sort of self-hate comes in and internalize and so that's all of that um but i suppose that there's only so much before you go well it's a yeah yeah that's actually quite funny yeah maybe you're right anyway let's move on and it's embarrassing of course it's embarrassing it's humiliating um and it's it's very difficult to call out yeah especially when it's with a, a peer and a, and, a, and a friend you know I, I i was struck as you were saying that dan i was like well if that happened to you on a street you would be mm. quite fearful of your safety because actually mm. those sort of moments escalate and there's something hidden behind it. And of course, in a, in, a, in a school setting, you don't do that, but you strip away those walls and, and, you, and suddenly it's a very different joke. And, and, and the thing is, is that, you know, those rooms are microcosms of, of society, really. They're not in any way special to, to the school. They are just what mm. people think is acceptable. It, it's it's really difficult because it's 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 a catch twenty two because as a Jewish person you're you're going to be hearing this joke and I completely understand why you would feel uncomfortable especially if you're the only Jewish person there or there's maybe one or two of you you it's it is hard to call that out and then so you might think well I'm just not going to say anything and then the person making the joke might think oh they're cool with it so well, no biggie exactly and uh, often. I find the people listening, if someone overhears, suddenly that's another person that thinks I can target the Jews. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, that like antisemitism is, an, is, I think, a form of discrimination that is sort of a, a witnessable crime in a way, and that it's, it's kind of, it's, it's contagious. It's a little bit infectious that we witness it. And it's some reason it's then you see it accepted and you go, well, I'll try that later on, I think. Mm. I there's also, as a, as a, you know, Jews historically are, are very good at laughing at themselves. And if Dan and I would make a joke that to us was be funny or self-deprecating, you know, there's a fear of that, if that gets overheard and someone thinks it's okay. Whereas, you know, in any other ethnicity or race or, or you know, uh, minority, you, you wouldn't do that. But for some reason... If, if, if two, two Jewish men make a joke with each other, it, it okays other people to, to make it too. And I, that in itself is, is so specific. Yeah, I, th I think that really, you know, is due to the dichotomy of anti-Semitism and that we, we are Jews, you know, simultaneously looked at as, as, you know, lower than other people, like, like vermin, like whatever, and at the same time in control of things. And it's, it's that thing that means that they're not quite, it's not really punching down. It's, it's always punching up that means, oh, these jokes are acceptable. That was mainly one of the reasons, sort of one of the big things, how I ended up justifying anti-Semitism growing up was that I began to see Jews as sort of a uh, symbol of power and of a symbol of uh, a possibly uh, an ideology and a... Uh, or whatever that I didn't agree with. And I started to see it as punching up going, well, actually, yeah, they deserve it because I didn't agree necessarily with politics that were going on or I, or I was, you know, receiving the news in a particular way and which I felt that, you, yeah, that, that, that it was punching up and that we weren't, we're not real victims because we're sort of, we're, you know, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Dan, you, you said that you wrote a document of every instance of anti-Semitism you experienced at the school and that it went on for pages. Um, and, and this question really goes to, to both of you. What, uh, what effect did all of these experiences have on your mental health and your social relationships there? 
I think um, essentially what it does is it kind of prevents full trust in other people. I mean, uh, as uh, in a drama school environment, I think in most environments, but in a drama school environment and in an actor's training, trust is so important, right? It's so important that you're able to trust everybody, you're able to open up and you're able to be vulnerable uh, and that leads to good work, right? That's sort of the understood um, language. But essentially what happens is you go, well, I'm... I'm with you in this space and I'm with the work, but I fundamentally cannot be myself and I cannot be truly open because there is a part of me that is so integral to me that you cannot accept. And that's like, I think one of the most damaging things about what this does is that it, it means that we have to keep something away. We have to tuck something away. And like, I'm very good at that. I'm very good at tucking my Jewishness away because I'm, I'm used to it and that's how I've learned to survive. But it means that, whilst everybody else, and obviously it's difficult for other people in, in, in other ways, but other people may not find it as difficult to fully open up and fully trust and fully let, let the training sort of hit them because they haven't had to face the, the, the remarks or the discrimination, or there isn't a part that you have to feel slightly ashamed of or something that will get in the way. I mean, Sam, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's tricky. In a, in a way, for me at least, I, I put up um walls you know with everyone you you kind of put up a little bit more of a defense and 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 you know it makes me question my own relationship with jewishness and my own identity you know before i i went to Gilto and, and i grew up in quite a and i went to quite a um, predominantly jewish school but funnily enough that that distanced me actually from my from my heritage i, I kind of wasn't interested in it so much and 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 um because i was so around it it didn't seem like a and it's not a novelty, but it certainly was at training when I was training. And then when I went to university at the first time in York, um, you know, I, I walked by Clifford's Tower, which is the famous tower where the, the Jewish people were burned. And for three years, I was pretty much ignorant to the history. You know, I, I really it, it didn't occur to me. And 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 then when I got to Guildhall and, and faced these people and and and, and comments and you know, realizing in one class, you know, the, the deep problems with Merchant of Venice, for example, I I trace my heritage a lot. And, and with the help of my mum, my mum has done loads of research and followed such an incredible history of, of, you know, escaping from the pogroms and going to Belfast and being some of the few Jews in Belfast and setting up a synagogue. And suddenly I connected with this history. So it, it, in a weird way, I put up walls, but it made me take a step back and, and question my own relationship with Jewishness. And frankly, you know, this is the first conversation like this I've ever had. And it is quite scary, to be honest, because um, I, don't know what, I don't know what I'm going to learn myself and I don't know what the response will be. And But it, it feels like a, a good time to, you know, I'm, I'm 29 years old and I'm only first opening the lid on, on this and that's in itself a problem i guess um yeah well you know i i i would actually say it's it's absolutely never too late to start looking into these things to start exploring your own history and and the persecution of of your people i think it's great when anyone at any age wants to do this and without being too schmaltzy sam i want to commend you on doing it you know at the risk of turning this into some sappy thing yeah i think i think it is great because it's not easy and, and really this goes for both of you i know this is um sort of new for both of you exploring the world of anti-semitism and in a way you are forced you are forced to do it you've, you've both had your breaking points and you're channeling this into a really creative experience that being this play and that sort of leads me to ask what are you hoping to that that people take away from this production i think you know the, the likelihood is that the audience will be filled with a lot of jewish people and a lot of supporters and uh i hope for them they see that they are part of so many different stories and they can see themselves in, in different characters. And there's a celebration, but also a, a questioning and, um, and also to see that Jewish stories can be really provocative and bold and uncomfortable. Um, and also maybe not Jewish, you know, they don't have to be Jewish stories. Don't have to just be about Jewishness. Um, 
And then for the, for the people who, who aren't Jewish, I, I, I hope it feels like just entering a normal theatre and they're going to be entertained by some plays which touch on some political points, but they're not, you know, it's, it's not like at the end we're going to, you know, have a ceremony and, and convert them all. I want, I want it to feel just like going, as you should be able to. Are you sure? The Sounds quite good. <laughs> Dan's like, hang on, I thought that's exactly what we were doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Take that off the poster. <laughs> <laughs> Two for one conversions. Um, yeah, I, I think that's obviously, I hope that people just are entertained and see, you know, there's so much negativity on, on Twitter and in, in headlines about anti-Semitism and it's always imbued with a with someone speaking out and then they're into fighting. And I hope that people come away and go, oh, that was really entertaining. And it touched on subjects which I hadn't thought about. And it's a celebration rather than always just a kind of debate, uh, you know, that ends in no one changing each other's mind. Mm. Dan, what about you? What are your hopes that, that, you, that people take away from this, this play? Well, when we started this out, I remember sort of, thinking i was talking to sam about this and i was thinking you know what's what would be great is if we can get a load of young jews from different areas uh and of different experiences with their jewishness and sort of and for them to be able to watch something and go uh oh yes i see my i see a little bit of my experience there or i see a little bit and it's not necessarily about young i mean i was thinking about you know I wish I could have gone and seen something like this when I was younger, um, part just to have some sort of experience. You know, I used to love going to the theatre. I used to love watching new writing. I used to, I used to absolutely love it. I still do, but particularly when I was younger, I would love to have gone and seen something in a in a theatre where I would have gone. Uh, here is art in a in a in a here is Jewish art in a sort of a proud and messy way. Um, so what so what I would love is for young you know, for, 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 for people to be able to go in and sit there and for an hour and a half get lost in some Jewish stories and take away, um, you know, I can, I can develop my Jewish voice and I can, and I, I can sort of speak my story and I can talk about these things. Something about talking, talking, it's so important and we're so bad at it, like we are so awful at it. Uh, I say as we record a podcast, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is really... It is really true, you know, that we, we don't talk. We don't talk about these things. Um, so maybe if people were to come and watch and they were to go away and they talk to their family and they talk to their friends about these kind of things and we get Jews talking to non-Jews about this and we get non-Jews talking to non-Jews. Because um, Sam's right, we don't want a room full of Jews. Um, you know, that's not necessarily what we're after. What we want is we want, uh, yeah, a load of non-Jews to come and see it and to go, oh, Here's a picture of modern day Jewishness in the diaspora in this country that is maybe slightly different as to what I imagined. They're not all wearing long, long black jackets and, and you know, and big boots like they are. Oh, OK. So these are Jews as well. Like, I think that's there's something in that that's really important because. Yeah, I think also just struck me as I. There's there's a fear, isn't there? I think among some Jewish actors and writers, of putting the Jewish stamp on your name, and I think as a if I was an actor coming into that room, I would want to feel really galvanised by a, a, a creative team of I guess how many down? It's about twenty five, twenty five really talented people being happy to go, this is, this is who I am. This is my stamp. It doesn't, it's not going to affect me in other castings or in the industry and et cetera, et cetera. But this just happens to be who I am. I think that for me feels, uh, you know, a scary prospect, but also one that I think we are championing. And, and we've had so much feedback from, from, uh, from our acting call out and, and other people we've spoken to of people being like, I'm so glad you're doing this. You know, this is really important. And that's been really um, fulfilling. That's really good. And and you speak about sort of promoting the visibility of, of Jews, that Jews can look like anything, and also about how we we need to speak about anti-Semitism more, we need to communicate more. It 
I want to bring us back to a moment late last year when the theatre world was forced to speak about anti-Semitism. This is the Royal Court Theatre debacle last year when the theatre came under intense scrutiny after the greedy billionaire character in the play Rare Earth Metal was given the name Herschel Fink, uh, an obviously Ashkenazi Jewish name. Many in and out of the Jewish community felt that this age-old anti-Semitic stereotype of Jewish wealth and Jewish power were being utilized here, and the theater ended up issuing more than one apology for not only the character, but how the situation was handled. You both mentioned earlier in the podcast that whilst this was all happening, you were at Guildhall uh, School having your own experiences of anti-Semitism. Um, what was your reaction sort of watching this unfold? And why do you think this sort of thing was even allowed to happen in the first place at the Royal Court? Well, I mean, firstly, it, it didn't surprise me. It wasn't su su surprising. Um, uh, and I think the most worrying thing is is obviously that this that it was flagged before it came out and that they had done workshops and they'd done readings and people had, to, to my knowledge, um, people had flagged it and said, I'm not sure about this. And for some reason, it still managed to slip through. Um, I don't think that the writer knew what was necessarily what they were doing. Well, I, I, I think I'm pretty sure that they didn't. I don't think that they're an anti-Semitic person. I think they, it's just another example of, stereotype and of prejudice and unconscious um, microaggression that is like permeates so much through anti-Semitism. Um, I think it's really, it's really, really sad. And for a while, I wasn't sure about whether I wanted to go and buy tickets and watch anything at the Royal Court. I know that, and I know that they've got a bit of a history with, with things and I know they are trying to work through stuff and they are trying to change. Um, but it was, it was sad. It was sad. And I found it a little bit, um, depressing and unsurprising but also a little bit I was a little bit sort of pleasantly surprised at the reaction because I thought well it's what's actually great here is they are listening and that there is a change happening and I don't think that something like that well it definitely shouldn't happen again and I'm not sure if it will um I think that there is a change happening and that the Jew, sort of Jewish Jewishness is being listened to and suddenly we're starting to um make our voices heard a little bit more um but it was deeply saddening it was it was i mean yeah it's such a blatant it's so obvious yeah i i won't say much more because dan's covered it really articulately um i think for me it, 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 the discourse online uh saddened me more that that seemed to become a you know a, a dumpster truck fire whatever the saying is <laughs> of 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 you know opinions and, and you know anger rightly so um but i think dan's right you know i think they were held accountable and i think you know the good thing about social media is pe people and institutions and theaters are held accountable and you said as it happened before i think you you wouldn't have to read probably all that much in in, in your local library of, of plays to probably see there have been many anti-semitic characters and we're at a really, um, yeah, you know, there's, it feels like a very much a watershed moment um, for theatre, and I, I, I'm, I'm pleased with the with the work that they've done in inviting more Jewish voices into their space and encouraging conversations and opening up dialogues, and uh, you know, they, they're doing that play in a few months' time. Um, I think it's called like uh, I can't remember the like Jewish Voices or something. Um, which is which is great, and maybe that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So, you know, I think it you got to be constructive. It was it was saddening, but we move on, and I think it, it is an important juncture in in all of our relationship with theatre. It, it is, it is, and and Dan, it struck me that you said you don't necessarily think um, that the playwright knew what he was doing. He's probably not anti-Semitic, and I wouldn't necessarily. Uh, disagree. I mean, one of our previous guests on the podcast, Kate Maltby, the theatre critic, she called it an act of unconscious bias. It's it's sort of this thing where these stereotypes, they're so ingrained in pockets of society that 
oh yeah, of course, it's a billionaire character. So yeah, Herschel Fink sounds about right, but not necessarily going to the next level of, I think Jews are rich and powerful. It's just like an automatic association. And it sort of sounds like that may have been what was happening to a degree at Guildhall and possibly in other parts of the acting industry. Yeah, absolutely. And then we have to think about well, what is the impact? Because there's one thing having that and then we go, well, hundreds of people are going to come and watch this show each evening. And suddenly that's that then is like an osmosis of unconscious bias starts to happen. I mean, and that's essentially how prejudice is sort of is, is sown, right? Is that in the media and in film and in TV, you know, a, 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 a small child can watch Oliver Twist and they see a carrot and they can see Fagan, who is, you know, in my opinion, an extremely anti Semitic trope, right? Uh, it's uh, that, that, that idea of the sort of Jewish pickpocketer played with a long nose or whatever. And suddenly seeds get planted and then they grow up and these prejudices are kind of confirmed and confirmed and confirmed. So we have to think about, well, yes, you know, the writer didn't know what they were doing and it's it's sort of it might be it might be a seemingly small thing to just change the name and they go well but but actually if you think about well what is the effect of these things the effect of the portrayal of jews or of yiddish tropes or of anything like this you know what are the effects the effects the effects and they are quite damaging I, th I think we also have to, a bit of a sort of step back a bit and you know for some reason i'm thinking about those horrific videos on on twitter of of a bus full of of orthodox jewish people and um being racially abused and i think that had less impact than a character name in a, in a play and i and i can't quite wrap my head around that i think you know obviously i actually can't I, it, it strikes me as it's like you know one thing is, is a name change and, and dan's writer has a huge ripple effect on people who might view it and another is a the state of society where that happens, people watch it, and then the next day we forget. Nothing changes. And I, part of me thinks, yes, the royal court thing was terrible, and it's important to address those things. And they are, you know, probably I think a publicly subsidised institution, and it's important they are held accountable. But at the same time, it, it's a bit like a uh, there's probably a, a metaphor, but it feels very. Infantes infinitesimal. No, I'm going to take that back. It feels tiny in comparison to the bigger problems, really. I I I know what you're saying. I mean, the 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 Orthodox Jews on the bus incident. You know, at the risk of sort of turning this into a different conversation, we we do know that anti-Semitism against identifiably Jewish people, that meaning very Orthodox or Haredi people, where you can see from how they're dressed that they are. Jewish, um, they wear kippot, they wear certain clothes. Anti-Semitism is very uh, often thrown against these types of Jews. And sadly, it's very easy for, for people to sort of disassociate themselves from that sort of discrimination, because it's like, oh, well, these sorts of people who are Jewish look like me. They don't wear any weird clothes and they don't say anything that I don't understand. So I identify more with these people. These Jews, on the other hand, I can't even relate to these people a tiny bit. Mm. And so I'm not so bothered when the discrimination is happening against them. And I think there was a big element of that at play. Sure. Dan, you spoke about the impact of this osmosis of... of um, putting on this play uh, with this character and, and audiences seeing that. Now, I also want to bring up the effect that this would have on Jewish creators such as yourself. You know, one of our previous guests on the podcast, the actor Eddie Marzen, he said that, in his opinion, Jewish creators are afraid to put their heads above the parapet, possibly due to the fear of either not being taken seriously or even having their valid concerns being wielded against them, possibly hurting career prospects. What do you both make of that? I mean, is that something that resonates with you, Sam? Do you know, I, a year ago, and probably before the, the Royal Court thing, I would have agreed with you. But for me, where I'm at in, in my career and, you know, just starting out, really, I've been I've been really pleasantly surprised by the amount of castings I get, which are specifically for Jewish roles and asking for Jewish actors. I feel like 
and and and, and I also get fifty percent of the other things are, are non Jewish roles. Like for me, it feels there is an important change happening, and it's not perfect, and and it, and it still needs to be addressed. And and I'm sure we'll touch on it about Jewish actors playing Jewish roles, and but at least I feel as though there is a real, um, uh, yeah, attempt to. Well, I, I also think it actually means that lots of Jewish stories are going to be made in the next two or three years. There's there's honestly so many films and TV shows about Jewish stories in production. Um, I think it's going to be a really exciting time, and I, and yeah, that's my feeling. Yeah, I, I, I agree in some ways with Sam, but I also disagree in, in others. Um, I think there is always, a, you know, and I think will forever be an ingrained fear of putting uh, one's head above the parapet. I think that's that comes with, I mean, in my experience, that comes with being Jewish. And that's, and that's partly an inherited thing, which is the idea that, well, you know, uh, I'm never quite sure what this person might do with the information. So they might, you know, I, you, you never quite know what your neighbor or your friend, but, you know, that's a, a well-known historical fact. Um, and in terms of in the context of the industry, I think it's a similar thing. And it's like, well, I'm giving away something about my integrity, my sort of integral being. And look, being an artist and being Jewish, they're two very different things. And they're, they're sort of they are completely separate, right? My, my Jewishness is, is uh, I was born into being Jewish. It's a very different thing as to, well, I've chosen to be an artist and I've chosen to be an actor. And I don't necessarily have to be a Jewish mm. actor for the mm. rest of my life. I might just want to be an actor. And it might, I'm, I might be scared that revealing that I'm Jewish and being a notably Jewish creative, that might color my experience and it might corner me and it might suddenly might, and all the prejudice which we know come from the outside world about being Jewish, suddenly that might come against me sooner down the line. And whether we're then scared to speak up about things because we think, well, in the in the future, someone might not hire me because they think, oh, if we, we've suddenly got to be really careful about a project, if we have <laughs> this guy on board mm. because we might make a mistake and they might complain or, oh, we might get the Jews <laughs> moaning again. We might get the, the Chronicle on our case <laughs> or whatever. You know, it's like we are, I think Sam's right. Things are changing massively. I mean, the fact that we can do this project is is amazing. And I, and if you'd asked me three or four years ago whether we'd be doing this, I'd have said no chance, no chance. So the fact that we're doing this is amazing. And, and it, it is in its sense the whole idea is we want to do we want to put our heads above the parapet and we are like massively putting our heads above the parapet but it's still extremely difficult and i still think that you know i'm going to be struggling with it for the rest of my career about how much i can be open and it will be different in each room and and there are some rooms i know there are some rooms where if you were to to talk about your being jewish or reveal your sense of jewishness it is it is risky it is and it's for and it is because it's still received. It, it's um, it's not easy, you know. Um, so I completely, yeah. It's it's really difficult. Mm. And and I suppose as you go along through your career, the way you navigate this and and the, it will change. Um, and and hopefully you don't experience it as much. But should you experience it, the way you handle it as a, as a veteran actor in your 40s, 50s and 60s probably won't be the same way you handle it in in your 20s. Um, Sam, you mentioned Jewish uh, roles being given to, to non-Jewish actors. And I think that's been a, a, a sort of a big debate as of late. Um, and, and let's talk about that. You know, some say that Jewish parts must only be played by by Jewish actors in order to not only avoid impersonating someone from an ethnic group to which they don't belong and which therefore could lead them to inhabit stereotypical and offensive traits, but also to avoid potentially taking a role away from an actor who might actually be Jewish. On the other hand, other people feel that it's the job of an actor to step into a role that challenges them, that the very point of acting is to pretend the character of someone different to who they are and that in fact coming from outside that identity can also make that character more sympathetic to viewers who are also outside of that identity as jewish actors yourselves i'm interested in what your thoughts are on this debate it's the million dollar question i mean it is it's the it's the one and it's really difficult 
and I change. I some t- I, I seem to fluctuate from side to side, from side to side. I think the most important thing to note is that there is no correct answer. There is no absolute method that we can write down and send around and say this is the way we are going to work. It just doesn't exist. And I think the 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 more we can believe, sort of understand that, and get away from the idea that there's a a, sol- a solve- solving of an equation, the better, because it's just not going to happen. Um, I mean, we could talk about experiences. Uh, we did Merchant of Venice, like Sam said. We did that in a sort of workshop format at Guildhall. Um, we had to sit there and watch somebody who wasn't Jewish uh, play Shylock and read his words. And that was, I mean, and and I'm very strong in believing that that is not okay. I don't think that is ever okay. Um, a character who is so integrally Jewish, who his Jewishness is so individual and so... Um, distinguished within a context of a play, a Jewish person has to play that role. And I think a, a Jewish director has to direct that play. Like, I, f- I feel that that is absolute. And then there are other, there are other, and, and, and interestingly, we, we talked about it, and, and, and this picks on something that you said, Ellie. Somebody said, um, oh, well, I've read Shylock's words, and now I've feel a little more like I understand what it is to be Jewish or something. I, I just thought that's nonsense. I thought that is nonsense. It, it's not, it shouldn't be our, our trauma and our experiences. And let's get it straight. Shylock is a, a sort of a Jewish immigrant who was ghettoized, bullied, spat upon, racially abused, picked apart. That is the experience of our ancestors. That experience shouldn't be used by another creative as a chance to sort of explore something, uh, unless it's done in a very safe environment. In a very, that just shouldn't be the case. But there are plays where there might be a load of Jewish characters and the director might be Jewish. There are instances where that can happen. It, it has to be very specific and it has to be held very well. But I think it can happen. And I think it's often to do with the makeup of a creative team and the makeup of a company and a particular play but it can be very interesting to watch to watch people take on other people's experiences and other people's skins. I don't think we should ever get to a point where only certain people can play certain roles. I just don't think that that's helpful. Um, and I don't think well, that will happen. But there's got to be a balance. The Merchant of Venice stuff, that can't happen. We can't watch non-Jews take on such such important and such traumatic and such particular Jewish roles um but let's not ban it like let's not let's not talk about a ban across the whole thing it, it's really complicated i, I just to quickly just I, I was recalling when you were talking about that experience down with merchant of venice how someone said um oh you know i i, I get that it's anti-semitic but but shakespeare gave charlotte one of the best speeches in in, in his whole canon of work and i was like Really? <laughs> you think because he's given him a good speech that we like should sim- like be more sympathetic towards the writer's intentions? I don't know. It just it was that was amusing. Um, <laughs> I think Dan, he gave him a speech. We're equal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let them talk, and then then we're done. Um, Elliot, when like, when you were just um, beginning this question, you you gave such two strong sides to the argument that I swung both ways in in my pendulum swung as you did it. And I think that is because like Dan said, I think part of the problem of the discourse is that we are trying to find an answer and there never will be one. And it will be specific to every project and every creative team and every cast member, you know, every individual. Um, I think going forward, it's important that we just accept that there's going to be a, a, kind of a litany of different opinions and some performers may feel very strongly and and rightfully so and some others you know feel as though an actor should be able to take on another person with 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 no kind of preconditioned or like prejudice that they are in some way you know not not meant to, right to be doing it and i think but you know as dan said there are occasions as with all uh texts where you know um only specific people to that identity should be playing. I think I can't remember who, who wrote. Um, is it Fences, the, the play by August Wilson? 
I August think there month. is something in his in his con in his kind of uh, will that says my play should only ever be performed by um, people of uh, Afro American heritage or or something along those lines. And and I, you know I think then it should be a disclaimer: Merchant of Venice <laughs> that maybe Sherlock should only be played by a Jewish person. But saying that. Actually, Dan, I think we were in a rehearsal room where someone was playing Shylock and maybe he wasn't Jewish. I can't remember. Um, and, and a different one to school and a fabulous actor. And I don't know, it was illuminating. I, I learned something new and he wasn't playing the, the, the tropes of, of what we perceive Jewishness to be. Um, I think if we see it, see it each, each casting that happens and each, each play and each production as a kind of a new conversation, a new, a new way to learn and view things differently. I think we might be, have our eyes opened a bit and, and stop and maybe stop arguing so much. Yeah. And just to add on to that quickly, I do think that the, the benefit of the doubt should always go the way of us. You know, I think if there's any doubt, I think it should always be, we will overcompensate. I do think that. And I think for the time being, that's really important. Well, it goes. It just goes back to that thing. Like, listen to Jutes. Listen to how they feel. If they're saying mm. that oh, this makes me uncomfortable, listen to them. It's very clear that you've both been on been on this journey of being at Guildhall and experiencing anti-Semitism to the point of not really feeling comfortable addressing it. To now, where you're putting on a production that has been inspired by these experiences. What advice would you both give to Jews in the theatre industry who may be experiencing anti-Semitism but not sure what to do? Find other Jews that you can talk to and you can say, uh, this happened and I'm not sure about that. And more often than not, someone else can go, that is anti-Semitism um, or that's not OK. This, you know, Just try and talk as much as possible and if you can, call it out, call it out. And, and you'd probably be surprised that people are willing to listen. If I could say something to myself 10 years ago, uh, I would say, call it out more, call it out more. So I think talk, and there are so many different networks out there now of theater Jews and sort of Jewish people in the industry and in the creative world. And we are all talking and we are all listening to each other. Um, and it's empowering. I think um, the, uh, there's a sort of on uh, twofold here is like is that whilst anti-Semitism is is a kind of uh, unifying thing in the sense that we all we all can kind of unite on the of of what we've been through, I think there is such an incredible plethora of stories and histories um, and journeys, and I think for for me, you know, it's been about looking back. Um, I, I was, you know. Uh, talking the other day about intergenerational trauma and how you were, you know, raised by your grandparents, not your parents. And suddenly a lot of things clicked into place and it made me understand who I am a bit more and, and was proud of who I am. And I think that sense of empowerment would make it easier to cool things out. You know, it, for a lot of my childhood, I was, I was Sam who was technically Jewish, but wasn't interested in, in that. And maybe when I experienced anti-Semitism, I would have not uh, not associated myself with it, to be quite honest. But because I have, you know, I, I discovered my ancestry and, and can talk to my mum and talk to other family members, I suddenly go, oh, okay, I am I'm proud of, of of what they went through and what and of who I am. And I think there's a real um, empowerment to that kind of self-discovery. Um, and to also reiterate, yeah, talk. Talk to also non-Jews, you know, a lot of people are really open to to changing their mind and, and, and being enlightened by your experiences. Yeah, ab absolutely. What are your both of your, your uh, final words about the play, any information about it, and, and any uh, your, your message to people who, who might be umming and ahhing about, about going to see it? How, what is your pitch? And also, where can people find you? <laughs> so we can, we're on Twitter. Um, our company is called Emanate Productions. The at is at Emanate Prods. Um, uh, no spaces or underscores or anything. Um, we're 
we're at the Kiln Theatre in northwest London in Kilburn. It's just next to Kilburn uh, Underground Station. And we're there on the 8th and 9th of August. It's a Monday and a Tuesday night at 8 p.m., both nights. Um, six short scenes. There'll be about an hour and a half the whole evening. No interval. You can get home nice and early. Um, and tickets are £10, so it's cheap for what you're getting. You're getting a lot for your money. <laughs> um, I won't say any more about that. <laughs> um, but there, it will be... A really interesting evening. I mean, it's a world premiere of new work from some really prolific writers with some really good up and coming actors that Sam and I have. Some of them we've worked with, some of them we haven't. And we're really excited to get them together. And it's going to be something that's, it's we're, we have no idea really what's going to happen. Um, and that should be quite exciting. And hopefully mm. we'll get Jews, pe Jewish people coming who will see, see things that they recognize. We'll get non-Jewish people coming and it might open their eyes a little bit. There'll be a, a post-show discussion on the 8th afterwards. If you don't have to get home early, you can stay for that. Um, we're yet to decide who's on the panel, but hopefully that will be a really interesting discussion. We can talk through lots of things. Um, and generally, it would just be, it will be a really interesting evening that we hope will be a first of many as well. Um, Sam, have you Anything I missed out? Yeah, any, thanks, Dan. Any important information? You, 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 <laughs> you've given me a given me a load to talk about. I don't think quite mentioned it's at eight pm um, at, at, at the kiln. Um, no, all I will say is this is probably the the only time that these artists, the writers, directors, and actors, who many of them will be household names. I mean, some of them already are, are going to be sharing a stage together. Um, and I actually think that's quite amazing. Like we, we genuinely have six incredible pieces of work from, from some of the most prolific writers um, at the moment and, and some actors who are on, burgeoning on very, very successful acting careers and directors who are wonderful as well. Um, 8 p.m. at the kiln. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's 8 p.m. Easily accessible by the overground. <laughs> um, yeah. All thank right, you. Dan Wolf and Sam Thorpe Spinks. Thank you so much for appearing on Podcast Against Antisemitism. It's been a real pleasure talking to you both. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much for having us.